Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second CCC OER webinar for 2018. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to um, another wonderful um, webinar we've scheduled for you. My name is Regina Gong, and I am from Lansing Community College. I am the OER project manager there. And I am also the VP for professional development here at CCC OER. Um, we're thrilled to have folks um, from um, the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges and the Florida Virtual Campus to talk about um, the findings that um, they have from their student surveys on college um, textbook affordability and its impact on our students. So um, for our agenda today, we'll, um, I'll just give you a brief overview of what we do here at CCCOER, um, including uh, the activities that we have um, for you in the next um, month or so. And then we'll hear from our um, speakers. Um, we'll do the Florida research um, from Florida Virtual University first, and then the SBCTC. And then after that, um, we'll have Q&A. So if you have any questions, just feel free to um, type them in the chat box and we'll answer them towards the end of the presentation. So, um, I'd like you to um, meet our speakers. We'll start with Boyung Che and Sarah Delaney of SBCTC, and then we'll go, um, and then we'll um, do Robin Donaldson of a Florida Virtual Campus. So Boyung, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bo Young, and uh, I'm a policy associate of Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Hi, this is uh, Sarah Delaney. I'm a research, research analyst here at the Washington State Board. Hi, I'm Robin Donaldson. I'm the Director of Instructional Research and Member Services at Florida Virtual Campus. Thank you, Boyung, Sarah, and Robin. Um, just, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what we do here um, at CCC OER. For those of you who might be new to CCC OER, we are celebrating our 10th year anniversary this year. And um, since we were founded, uh, we were founded to support um, community college uh, mission of open access. Basically, we want to expand awareness and access to high quality OER. Um, we also support um, faculty choice and uh, professional development through webinars such as this and um, our face-to-face -face workshops for faculty and staff engaged in OER projects. Ultimately, our goal is to improve um, student access. So just to give you um, an idea or a quick update on our membership map, um, we'd like to welcome our new members who joined us this year. Um, if you are here, a big shout out to you. Um, we have um, new members from Butte College in California, um, Central Maine Community College, Lakeshore Technical College in Wisconsin, um, Mount Wachusett, in Massachusetts and the Raritan Valley Community College in New Jersey. Um, we actually have 65 um, CCCO we are members, 11 system-wide memberships across um, 28 um, states here in the US. And we also have members from um, Canada as well. So if you want to see um, a list of the schools we have as members, just go to the cccoer.org website and um, under that you'll see um, our membership list. Also just want to remind you of this, um, our big annual celebration. Um, which is the Open Education Week. It's gonna happen in less than two weeks. It will be um, on March 5 to 9. 
and it is actually run by our parent organization, which is the Open Education Consortium. So basically what um, Open Week, um, Open Ed Week does, it's, it's a global celebration and an annual opportunity for us to create awareness on our campuses, um, sharing our open education projects and activities with our colleagues um, around the world. And so you can actually highlight um, the activities and projects that you plan on doing during that week by submitting it um, and you know that those projects will be available for the whole year for other people to um, take a look at. So I suggest you take a look at um, OpenEducationWeek.org and see the many activities that our colleagues around the world will be doing. Also want to give uh, a plug to our um, Open Education Global Conference. Um, this year it will be held in Delft, the Netherlands on um, April 24 to 26. Uh, personally, I haven't been to any of the Open Ed uh, Global Conference, but I hope I'll be able to do that um, next year. It's actually a wonderful opportunity for us to meet educators around the world who are focused on broad, broadening um, open education and expanding access. So if you are able to, to join um, Open Education Global Conference this year, we welcome you. And so um, moving on now to our presentation today, we are so lucky to have our speakers today who will talk to us and share with us um, results of their survey and research regarding um, the impact of affordable learning materials on students. Most of you have probably seen um, or familiar with um, the surveys done by Florida Virtual University. Um, I myself use um, the results of their survey when I do my presentations here on campus. And um, you will hear from Robin uh, the many interesting things that they are doing, um, what they will be doing. She's actually uh, been doing the survey since 2010 and would be interesting to hear what's coming up next for um, the FLBTC survey. And as for our colleagues at SBCTC, Boyung and Sarah will share with us um, key findings from their survey of um, 10,000 Washington community and technical college students. This survey is very, um, I mean, it's unique, I think, because they have partnered with um, the Washington Community and Technical Colleges Student Association to deploy this survey. And it will be interesting to hear from Boyung and Sarah um, the results of that. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Robin. Here we go. Okay, I'm requesting uh, access now so I can go through the slides. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to explain a little bit about Florida Virtual Campus. Um, we're actually not a um, institution. We don't have students here. We are legislatively uh, mandated and funded through um, the Florida legislature. And what we do is we have several units and we provide statewide uh, innovative educational services to Florida's K-12, well, K-adult rather students. <clears throat> and um, one of our roles is to try and continually find ways to affor um, improve affordability and accessibility at our colleges in Florida. And one of the ways we do that is to conduct research on student success and affordability. So during this um, presentation, I'll be providing you with a summary of our uh, 2016 statewide research on the cost of textbooks and instructional materials. And as Regina said, we've been doing this since 2010. And then I will also give you an update um, throughout as far as how things will be changing for 2018. We'll be administering it this year also. So 
Florida has um, 40 public higher education institutions. And um, we've got, this is back in 2016, but um, we, we have um, almost 3 million students with uncompleted college degrees. And college affordability, as you know, is, is usually uh, viewed as a financial challenge uh, for the textbooks and instructional materials. And that's been an ongoing concern here in Florida and other states. So um, what we've done is we, we administered this survey in, in 2016, we had more than 22,000 uh, students participate. And the findings are suggesting that the cost of textbooks and materials is in negatively impacting um, our students' academic success, not just their um, um, financial debt. Um, so, so between financial debt and success, it, it, it's, it hits them doubly hard. So, <clears throat> um, the reason we administered this uh, survey is to provide, since we're legislatively uh, funded, we want to provide the uh, state university system and the Florida college system, as well as all 40 institutions, with basically, uh, since 2010 to 2016, a snapshot of what was happening in spring 2016, uh, or each spring, as far as uh, the cost of textbooks and how it's impacting them. So, um, statute was changed, and so where before we used to only ask them about textbook costs, we now also ask them about instructional material costs. And then for 2018, um, we'll be uh, deploying that um, through March and April. Um, we also are collecting um, cost data on what the students would have spent in fall 2017 and what they will have spent in 2018. In addition to, to really um, get us a better focus on the impact, we're also trying to understand, we'll ask them how many courses they're taking uh, in the spring term and the fall, and then um, how many of those courses required them to buy textbooks. Because as you know, there's a huge inif initiative for um, um, Z programs and zero cost or OER courses. So we want to find out if they say they're spending, let's say $300 uh, in spring, well, how many courses are you, you uh, how many courses is that actually for? They might have been registered for four, but only two of them are requiring them to buy textbooks. So, um, as I mentioned, the purpose is, is to um, inform or the institutions, the Board of Governors and the uh, college system. Um, we get system level support in, in the deployment of this survey, which has been really a, had a huge impact on the participation level. So, and the objective, <clears throat> um, is to, to really find out from the students how much they're spending in fall 2017 and spring 2018, um, how often they're having to buy books that they're not using, how it's impacting uh, the cost that's impacting them and the choices they make, the study aids they like, and how this is changing over time. Um, so we had uh, 40 institutions, like I mentioned, 22,000. And then here you can see the distribution of who's participated in it. And in 2016, we had a new university that joined, uh, that was created, and they joined into this, this survey. And I just provided you the, the a link to the legislation, why, why we actually uh, do what we do. It addresses access and affordability. <clears throat> So um, in Florida, over 53%, they were spending um, 300 or more. And 18% uh, were spending 400. And that's just in the one term, that's in spring. And as I mentioned, we weren't aware of how many courses they, they were enrolled in. So it'll be interesting to find out 
um, that aspect in uh, 2018. Um, <clears throat> then we had um, the course materials, instruction materials. Th those are things like your uh, My Math Lab, et cetera. So, so in, in addition to the textbooks, they're also spending um, at least, you know, 200 or less, but some of them are spending two to four hundred dollars, and a, a few of them, six percent, are spending four hundred or more on instructional materials alone. <clears throat> and um, so, in terms of the cost of our the textbooks, um, it was our college students. So we do a comparison of college students and universities also. So it was the college students who seem to be um, more heavily impacted by um, the cost of the textbooks and instructional materials. So um, for textbooks, 56 were, uh, were spending um, $300 or more and that's versus for the university side, uh, about 45% were spending um, 300 or more. Uh, <clears throat> then we have uh, for instructional materials cost, um, again, 12% of the college students were reporting spending 300 or more on their course materials. And that's compared to the 9.8 of the university students. So you can see for, for some reason, it is impacting our students more heavily. The, um, this survey does not get down into to the details with the students as to why? So we can't answer the question why this is impacting the college students more. All we can see is that it is impacting them more. And one of our other questions that we want wanted to find out is, so of the college, the books that you're being told you're required to buy them, we're also wanting to know, okay, are you actually using them? And it doesn't seem like a lot. It may not seem like a lot to you, but to go from 2012 to 2016 and for them to report a change from 1.6 books to 2.6 books, that's a big jump. And again, we're not sure why that was occurring. So <clears throat> then we've got the financial aid component. So this hat goes into the debt and it also impacts them uh, as far as when they can get access to their book because some as you know many of your students have to wait until their financial aid comes in before they buy their book um and so we also wanted to know how how much it was impacting their overall college debt so um what was interesting in this is that there was less financial aid covered for textbooks in 2016 versus in 2012. And of those who were receiving financial aid, 20% 20, 20 were reporting that the financial aid covered the total cost. But 50% reported that the financial aid um, only covered some of the textbook costs. And then the 29% reported uh, it didn't, financial aid didn't cover any portion of their textbooks. Um, so then we have, so what's, what's the impact? How is this really impacting our students? So it, it, it's not just financially, it's their progress through their degree program, because as you can see here, it may cause them to withdraw from a class. You see, you've got 20% there or even drop a class. So what happens is they enroll in that course. They find out once they get in there, that that textbook they can't afford the textbook they may have been able to afford the course but they can't afford the, the textbook so they drop the course that's going to impact how um quickly they may get through their their degree program so um here you can see 45 percent are saying they don't register for a specific course um, or they may take fewer courses 47 percent are saying they take fewer courses um, this is troubling right here, 37%. They're not buying that textbook, um, and that can cause them to earn a poor grade. Um, no surprise there um, that it would cause them to earn a poor grade without a textbook. Um, and then 
then you've got those who aren't buying that textbook and um, they, they feel that that's caused them to fail the course. Um, this number right here as, as a uh, t as adjunct instructor, seeing that 66% are reporting that they don't buy that book, um, that's, that's really troubling. So um, one of the key findings is that, um, uh, well, hang on a sec, um, is also, let's see, did I do the back? Okay, so here, this was just the comparison here. So um, here you can see the 2012 is blue, 20, 2016. So here, it's, this has gone up a little bit here um, as far as not purchasing the textbook. Um, and 30, this went up too, they're not buying the book and they say they feel that it's caused them to earn a poor grade. More of them are reporting they're not buying the textbook in it, they, they're failing the course. <clears throat> so then we looked at, so what, what are they doing to try and reduce their textbook course? Um, and as a faculty member, I have to say, this, this is something um, you hear over and over again. They're buying the book from somewhere other than their campus bookstore. Um, and almost 50% are saying they're buying used books and then, and, and then renting books. So, um, but here, right here, you can still, for, almost 49% are saying they're still using that campus bookstore. Um, um, some of the libraries will keep a digital or um, um, hard copy of a textbook. And here you've got share, share a, a book with a classmate, 23%, almost 24%. And one of the problems with that is that when you share a textbook with a classmate, while on, um, it looks like it would be okay to do that. But what happens is, is once you've got a test or assignments due, you may not get that book until midnight or later. So, or somebody who actually bought the book might say, stop being willing to share it with you. So while um, on the surface, surface that looks like a good idea, this also has problems. Um, and so, so overall, our, our, the big takeaway from this is is that really getting access to your instructional materials, that shouldn't, shouldn't be a barrier to them being able to access a course um, and be successful in it. And it shouldn't be a barrier to their being able to complete their degree in a timely manner. Um, and uh, what we want to do here in Florida, and I'm sure in other states, is try and assess uh, whether or not the use of the OER is, is having a um, impact on student success, their time to graduation, and whether or not they're carrying a heavy, heavier load uh, because they are able to um, register for courses that aren't requiring them to buy textbooks. And the student success rate is not just having access, but having access on day one. So those are, those are some of the areas that we would like to explore more heavily. Um, I did want to mention for the 2018 survey, if you, uh, your institution or your state is interested in having us um, uh, administer the 2018 textbook instructional material survey for you, um, we'd be happy to do that. There isn't a cost. What we do, this is a free service that we provide our institutions. So what we end up doing, the way it works is we provide our institutions with um, the link to the survey and the institutions are responsible for putting it in their um, LMS or communicating it through whatever uh, campus channels they want to use for surveys. And then after it closes, what we do is we then um, send each of the institutions their data as well as the, the um, um, you know, 
the survey instrument will give you the, the nice graphs and, and charts, and we'll provide them that. So if your institution is interested in having us do that, um, we'd be, I'd be happy to um, talk to you about it. Um, my contact information, I believe, is in one of the um, earlier slides. So, um, Regina, how do you want to handle questions? Um, you want to wait till the end? Yeah, maybe we'll wait till the end. Okay. Okay. Um, this is, oops, and I'm having trouble advancing. There you go. That's all I've got then. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. You're right, welcome. Um, now we are um, turning over to Boyung and Sarah to show us um, the results of their surveys in Washington. So there's going to be a handover here. Um, so excuse us for a bit. Um, Sarah, I'm going to stop share. I need we are we are, we are I did already. Hi, can everyone hear us? Yes. Thank you. And can you see the screen that we are sharing? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, we are without further ado, we are we will go right into it. Um, so uh, first, some contextual information to help you understand how this research was initiated and where it is going from here. So um, Washington SBCTC is actually a state government agency that supports our system's 34 community and technical colleges. And our agency manages a coding manual that states how to code and categorize the courses. So um, all of our system college courses are electronically coded based on these rules. So um, in there, we actually added a brand new code that tags the courses that use open educational resources in May 2016. And after that, we uh, conducted a statewide survey um, asking for the input from our faculty members uh, on the name, description, and the criteria of the code. And based on the feedback received, uh, we modified the implementation guideline for that OER code. And um, after that, uh, meanwhile, uh, during the 2017 legislative session, a supporting bill passed uh, requiring that colleges mark the courses that use OER and, and make that information available at the time of registration for our students. So, um, you know, so OER code was safely added to the coding manual with the implementation guideline, and now there is a supporting law that, manda that mandates this coding. Um, but the, what happened was, um, there was this feedback that consistently given uh, during the faculty survey and it was that feedback was about the need to mark those courses that use other affordable course materials that are not technically OER, you know, such as library resources or uh, really inexpensive commercial textbooks. Um, they don't really fit into the definition of OER because they are fully copyrighted with all rights reserved. But um, those resources do offer more affordable options for our students and they do need to be visible at the time of registration as well. So we have begun another journey and uh, this time to establish a, a low cost code. Um, and we immediately faced this challenge um, to identify a, a cost threshold, you know, like to tell how low is low enough. And we realized that the answer really has to come from our students. So we have conducted another statewide student survey, and that is what we are presenting today, the findings of the survey. So that's the whole background. And, uh, and these were the specific research questions that were investigated during the survey. And um, identifying the threshold for the low cost code was the primary purpose um, of the survey, but um, we were hoping to explore the influence of the course materials cost and also wanted to have a chance to hear students, student ideas to improve the affordability issues of the, of the course materials in our system. And um, here are the steps taken for the survey design and distribution. 
Um, so from the beginning to end, uh, from the beginning to end of the survey distribution, it was clearly a student-led process. Um, it started with uh, creating a partnership between us, state agency, and WAXA, Washington Student Association. And um, it, textbook affor affordability was one of our student associations legislative agenda for years. So we bonded immediately and we devised a, a survey together. And then um, WAXA was in charge of distribution entirely and the members of the student association of each college distributed the survey on campus. Uh, they went to the school cafeteria, or they waited outside of the classroom holding iPads, or they would set up a table outside on the club days talking to fellow students about the survey. So remember, the survey was done during the winter time, so their contribution and, um, and, and, and their, their contribution was uh, beyond what it was, well, beyond what, you know, beyond what anybody could imagine. And um, when the survey responses reached over 5,000, uh, we sent an email to all system councils and commissions asking for support. And uh, those system groups were really moved and inspired by our students' effort. So they really rallied uh, voluntarily and connected with um, their student associations to increase the number of survey responses. Um, so as a result, um, from this one-time student survey, uh, we received over 10,000 responses from our students, and we have organized our uh, preliminary finding in a dashboard to offer more interactive experiences. And um, Sarah, our data analyst, will guide you through the major findings. Hi, this is Sarah. Um, I'm going to go right to the uh, what I'm calling our splash page of our, our, of our uh, dashboard here. And I knew that Boyoung wanted this to go out nationally and maybe even internationally to OER people. So I wanted to give people a sense of context of where we are and who we are. So you can see that we're listing all of our 34 colleges and we have a map that indicates where they are. And we have some information at the top that was the kind of demographic information that we were interested in for our students. So um, we kind of wanted to crow about how many people participated in the survey. And then another category of student that, that we pay particular attention to are those that intend to transfer to a four year. So in our vernacular, those are, those are transfer students. So we wanted to show out of these 10,000, 6,000 were intending to transfer. We also wanted to know what their financial aid status was. And we're always concerned about getting our students through. And we know if our students aren't carrying 15 or more credits per quarter, they're not going to graduate on time. So we, we asked them um, if they're just meeting the financial aid criteria, which would be 10 to 14 credits, 15 or more, or if they're, they're doing less than less than 10. So just this splash page is going to um, show that for you. And another thing to note, because I'm, this is also an introduction to Tableau, Tableau allows you to encode a lot of information. So right now, color is encoding whether it's a community college or a technical college. But I have a control here that I can now change it by college size. So now color is encoding the color size. So if you're from um, a medium size community college, you can check out what one of our medium sized community colleges um, did. The other thing that you can do here, or that you should notice, is that the size of the circles and the length of the bars matches their relative participation um, in the survey. And um, another Tableau uh, tip here is that always hover over something because a tool tip will pop up. So right now I'm hovering over South Puget Sound, which is located in Olympi Olympia, Washington, just a couple of miles from us. And if you click on it, all of a sudden you're just going to see South Puget Sound's uh, participation level and you'll see everything else recede into the background on both the map and the bar chart to help you find things better. And you click on it again, they come back. So it also works the other direction. So Edmonds was our college that had the highest participation level. So if I click on Edmonds, the numbers now change at the top. So they just reflect Edmonds and the map recedes so that 
you can find out where Edmonds is and it's just outside of Seattle. So now I'm gonna to go to our first of our findings pages. And um, as Bo Young said, one of the main reasons that uh, we wanted to do this was to establish a threshold. And in this case, um, I think of this as establishing a ceiling. So our students said $50 would be uh, a reasonable cost to pay. And the way that I would uh, look at that is that that's a ceiling. They would also be happy if we said $30 or $40, but 50 would be the ceiling. And again, this is Tableau, so hover over it and you'll get a tool tip. Click on it and I'm going to show you some um, information about the students who selected this amount. And you can see that it's roughly 50-50 on whether they receive aid or not. So if you remember, Edmonds was the, the college with um, the highest participation level. So let's change that. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to deselect everybody. So we're not sending a query through to the dashboard at all, so everything disappears. And we go down here and we find Edmonds, click on it, and now we've repopulated. And if you notice, $30 was the most popular with Edmonds. So let's, let's click on that. And you'll notice that, that Edmonds has more people that aren't receiving financial aid. Um, so that's worth paying attention to on this. So we've did, done it this way. So colleges can go through and uh, look at themselves. Somebody who's a legislator could go through and pick everybody in their district. Um, somebody from outside of us can go through and remember the college size. And, and you have to remember from the first slide, but you can go through and, and pick out colleges by college size. And one more thing I want to point out here is that we're encoding the, the information with color here so that the lower costs are a lighter blue and the higher costs are a darker blue. And you can see that they're not quite sorted in the same order that we had people that would tolerate a $100 textbook, um, $100 instructional materials, which would include textbook and, and other materials. But when you look over to the right for comparison, a new entry level chemistry book would cost $210. So if you're already paying that, a $100 textbook does sound better to you. So let's go on to finding two. Um, we asked just some information for people to indicate where they're getting their funding from and personal funds came out on top with that. Um, then now let's start looking at these, um, this other set of questions on the influence of course materials and uh, the Florida survey has similar kinds of things. And we also found that we have many of our students who are requiring the, the uh, borrowing the required materials from somebody else. And I find that very interesting. So uh, again, the way I've designed this, if you click on it, you're gonna find more information out about those particular students who have, uh, who often borrow the materials and click on it again and you bring everybody back again. So we have some of the same questions on whether people are dropping from a class or not registering. If I'm remembering right from Florida, we have uh, fewer students who are actually dropping or withdrawing. So our students are finding a way to persevere through this and you'll see some of the, the adaptations in the, the the student recommendations later on. But we also, we have students who are not registering for specific class or they're taking fewer classes. Um, as to having the required materials, we have many students who are going without the required materials. Um, again, you can click on this. It's gonna show more information about who they are. Uh, we, we have people who don't have the required materials on the first day of class, and they've taken uh, um, other classes uh, with, due to the material cost. We asked people specifically early on whether they were getting financial aid or not, and uh, they weren't consistent. Uh, with how they answered that question and with how they answered this question. So we wind up with a smaller subset if we're only looking at the people who said yes, that they're receiving financial aid. And we're finding out that a lot of our students 
uh, either never or rarely have their uh, their aid in time to purchase their course materials by the first day of class. And you can click again, and it's gonna show you more information about those um, particular students. And again, you can filter by college if you d desire. So we asked students, like if you had $100 to invest in these, these various ideas to improve uh, textbook and instructional material affordability, how would you do it? And uh, the most popular answer was to develop more free or low cost course materials on it. And you click on that and you can find out the number of responses that people had to that. And now we're coming to the section that I think is the coolest thing about, uh, about displaying data this way. We had lots of uh, student comments and people wrote lots of words in their comments on this. And uh, you can go through here and comb through it to see what our students had to say. So there's, there's two filters here. So if you click on um, here on the top one, you'll get a subset. So if we, if we now select course materials, then you get these sub themes that you have to actually um, click on in order to see the number of comments that people had. Now I'm going to turn this back over to Bo Young, who has um, these student recommendations in um, um, a higher summary level. Do we do we all see the PowerPoint screen back? Yes. Thank you. Um, so as you have just glanced, um, our students have recommended uh, various strategies for improving textbook affordability issues in our system. And their suggestions range from the issues of instructional practice to course materials acquisition to financial aid to policy and business practice. So um, when it comes to instructional practice, um, many students recommended to uh, recommended to avoid costly homework website access, which they are required to purchase on the top of the expensive commercial textbooks. Um, they also express concerns about um, ever-changing book editions, and they wish to be able to use older editions. And um, they also demanded a way to evaluate the usefulness of the required materials, uh, claiming that often um, only a small portion of the books uh, is, is used throughout the quarter. And um, many strongly recommended that um, their department and faculty members to be uh, more proactive in searching for the free and open resources. Um, earlier, Sarah mentioned that our students do persevere and one of the ways um, they managed to take classes without a textbook was that they would go out and search for the affordable materials that offer a matching content so um, they so they do know that um, equi equivalent materials uh, with uh, quality do exist out there. And finally, uh, many wish to see a clear distinction between required and optional materials in the syllabus um, so that they'll be, make, they'll be able to make more informed choices when it comes to purchasing the books uh, needed for their coursework. And um, when it comes to a course materials acquisition, um, they also do, they also, uh, they did share uh, brilliant ideas. And one of the strongly recommended, and strongly and frequently recommended ideas was this, the development of a statewide or college-wide book trading system, uh, where our students can donate, trade, or exchange the exchange used books. And uh, some also suggest, suggested a, a subscription-based rental system like Netflix for the books. And um, uh, our students also strongly recommended um, the avoiding the materials that cannot be resold, and they wish to have a longer checkout period for the library tax reserves. And when it comes to the financial aid, um, you know, many ask for creating a textbook fund for needy students to help them out to help them out of the financial emergency so that they can finish the program as scheduled rather than being delayed because of the cost of the instructional materials required by one course. 
And um, when it comes to uh, policy, uh, our students, many of them argue that we need uh, more statewide policies that promote the use of open and affordable materials. And um, they wanted to have more student involvement in the affordability discussion statewide. So, uh, the, and so um, the we and this is actually the end of our presentation, and we are going to paste the links to the slides, research brief, and the dashboard um, on the chat window. And um, they are all CC BY licensed, of course. So please feel free to share them out. And we wanted to note that this is only a preliminary findings. Um, so a full report with detailed data collection process and student narratives and and our recommendations will be released in March. So please stay tuned. And um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, our contact information is on the slides and feel free to contact us anytime. And we are going to uh, stop sharing this screen so that um, Regina could share back the original PowerPoint. Yeah, and while I'm doing that, Boyong, um, um, our participants have um, a few questions for you, and I'll start with um, Amy Hoffer. Um, Amy asks, um, have schools raised concerns about this um, available data being used for ranking purposes? So ranking purposes meaning that uh, in terms of number, of, in terms of level of participation from each college, could you elaborate your question a little bit? Um, Amy, maybe you can um, unmute yourself. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, concerned that college specific info might be sensitive if used for comparison with other schools? Well, if it was, if, if, if you refer to the uh, number of response, survey responses received, um, it was by no means to, uh, it, those information was not displayed to increase the com competition between the colleges. Um, it was more about uh, showing the level of um, interest from our students and their level of um, commitment and motivation to participate in this study. So that actually chart was uh, requested by um, our students and our many of the system councils and commissions, and they wanted to see the specific data from their own college. So it, it was created based on the demand from our colleges. So I, I think uh, their desire to have the, um, to learn about the level of interest from their college was uh, really, uh, was real. And I, I, there was appreciation expressed from many of the system colleges uh, to be able to figure out what's currently going on on their campus. Okay, well, thank you for that answer, Boyong. Um, we also have one question from Quill. Um, and she asked, um, do you think that the, how would you invest the $100 question in your survey um, is influenced by the fact that the WACTSA, um, who was distributing this survey, are pretty focused on OER as a cost savings measure for the past few years. Um, she's wondering if the results would be different if the survey was distributed through the institution instead. Oh, we, that's actually a really good question, and we were aware of the, um, we were aware of it before the survey was sent out. So um, actually, our focus, when it uh, when it comes to a, a full publication of this report, our focus will be on sharing the recommendations uh, submitted by our students, not about how they ranked uh, those uh, recommendations. So we. So that's almost a secondary finding, and um, what we would be really focusing when it comes to reporting would be um, those um, creative ideas that were directly recommended by our students without having any preconceived uh, ranking or ideas. Uh, this is Sarah. I heard the question a little bit differently. Our survey was, was student-led, so there was no connection 
with uh, a national OER group. So can you say that question again? It's a little long, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't submitted under the umbrella that that where OER answered the survey. It was it was initially uh, brought out by the students themselves. Okay. So it was labeled as the. I actually have the survey instrument in front of me. It it was labeled student survey affordable cost for class materials. Mm. Okay. So, I, and I can ask this question off list. This is Quill. Um, and and my question was actually Much more related to the student group that was sending that waxa has I mean it, they've been talking OER with our legislature in Washington State for years so they are it just depends on how they shared the survey at their colleges um, and I'm I'm mostly just playing advocate for the other side of the answer to that question I think the the creative answers they came up with are much more useful in a variety of ways. Yeah. But I think that there is bias in that that particular group has been talking about OER as a, if, if they were doing the survey one-on-one -on -one with students in their cafeterias, for example, they've been advocates for OER for, you know, five or six years. You know, actually, I could address that question um, easily because um, it wasn't so we, as, as we mentioned, the total number of responses for this one time survey was 10,000 and um, actually, and then the number of surveys that were um, conducted by that one on one connection with the student leadership were, I think the percentage is really low compared to the overall number of the responses. Uh, we after after we reached the 5,000 mark, uh, the rest of the 5,000 responses were uh, received after um, our system groups started posting the link to their um, website or LMS uh, login page. So they they didn't have any chance to um, have any kind of pre, uh, have preconceived conversation with any student groups and then all they had was on their uh, survey invitations and by those was um, school uh, uh, school admins was that uh, here is your chance to uh, share your ideas about textbook affordability click this link that's all they had so i believe that majority of the responses were received without having any preconceived ideas and um, if you actually read through the student comments the shared in the uh, dashboard page, you can see that uh, their level of understanding about free, free and open materials and affordability issues were pretty matured and deep, a lot more than, I mean, it's, it's pretty matured and deep and educated um, answers. So I could tell that if for them, it was, uh, it was nobody's research or charity project for them. It was uh, a survival issues that they think they and night about it. Um, thank you, Boyong. Um, I there's one question um, directed to Robin. Um, this is for Kevin. Kelvin, um, and he asked, "Does the survey cover um, courses with the highest cost, or course in which students are less likely to have access to the textbooks?" Um, we don't ask them specifically what courses they're taking, so there wouldn't be a way to to answer that question. However, what we do ask them is uh, we relate all this back to what degree they're seeking and what major area of study um, they're in. Mm -hmm. And we'll include that detailed analysis in the 2018 survey um, because the college system has provided us a way to collapse. We ask them about, gosh, it must be like 26 different um, areas of study. And that's too many to get an analysis of. So the college system at least has provided us a way to collapse it down um, to a more reasonable number. So we can give them some data on the major. Okay. And, and did you say you're going to start um, collecting for the 2018 survey in April? Did I hear uh, you? No. What we're going to do is the email will be going out as soon as it the IRB uh, okay. gives me the final approval. And so it will be open in Florida um, all of March and April. Oh. It, and then if a, um, an institution or a state uh, other than Florida wanted to be engaged, um, I don't think it would be a problem to open it up through the end of May if that's what they needed. 
Okay, well, thank you. Um, and we have one more question um, for Boyang and Sarah. Um, what percent of the 10,000 student response represents the student population? Um, how long was the survey available for students to participate? I think the total number of our student population in our 34 community and technical colleges is mm -hmm. about 365,000. Okay. And the uh, study duration was three months, starting from the end of September 2017 and ended on the December 27, 2017, so for about three months. Um, did that answer, answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so if you have any more questions, just feel free to type it in the chat box. If we don't get to answer it, we'll get back to you um, with the answers. Um, but before we end, I just want to um, make a plug about our forthcoming conferences again. I've mentioned about the Open um, Education Global in Delft, um, April 24 to 26. Um, the Open Ed Conference. So this one is um, always um, held here in the U.S. Last year it was in um, Anaheim. And this year it's going to be in Niagara Falls in New York. It's um, going to be on October 10 to 12. Um, I am in the program committee and um, now we're actually contacting our keynote speakers and um, soon we'll um, announce that and also open um, call for um, proposals. So, um, and of course, stay in touch um, through our community email. It's free to sign up. If you go to the CCCOER website under Get Involved, you can um, take a look at that. We'd love to have you. We always have a very um, engaged and active participation in our listserv. So, um, we invite you to join us there. Um, and... Let me see. And if you have any questions, oh, okay. So before I forget for the um, Open Ed Week, we have um, here at CCC OER, we are featuring um, OER adoption showcases. Um, that will happen um, March 7 um, from 9 to 2 Pacific um, standard time or 12 to 5 Eastern time. Um, we will be featuring all throughout um, those five hours um, community colleges from Arizona, California, Michigan, Texas, Virginia, and many more. Um, you will hear um, you know OER degrees, how they've implemented, um, including uh, details about their OER um, projects in their respective institutions. So I invite you to um, attend. If you can't attend the whole five hours, you can just pop in and out and um, would love to have you join us. And again, this are um, our contact information. If you have um, questions um, that you'd like to ask Boyung um, or Robin uh, or myself and Una, our emails are here. So um, I, I think that's, that's the end of our webinar. I like to thank you all for joining us and um, please watch out for our um, upcoming um, webinars. Um, just go to um, cccoer.org to um, see our future webinars. We'll see you in um, March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.